It is good to be in the house of the Lord and to see you here this morning. We want to we wanna welcome Karina and Alma. Let's give them a big welcome, Douglas First Assembly of God. We're always glad to have visitors and we appreciate you uh, coming and being among our midst. We want you to know you're always welcome. Always. Anytime you want to come. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I wish I could do something fantastic to uh, draw crowds. Sometimes you say, if everyone comes, I'm going to grow a beard or something. I thought maybe I'll do something fantastic. If everybody comes one day, I'll grow hair. But that's impossible unless I go get a chia plant or something, you know. Uh, I've seen them at Walmart. I don't know if they work on, you can put it on your head and it would work. But amen. It is, it is what it is. Hallelujah. God is awesome. And all the time. Yes, he is. I like that. Thank you, Sister uh, Kathy. Uh, we used to say God is good. She's, she introduced us to God is awesome. And he is really the only one that's truly awesome. We hear that word thrown around a lot. Oh, you're awesome. Oh, that job is awesome. But really, the only awesome one is God uh, in the true sense of the word. Awesome is like overwhelming. It's like completely almost more than human uh, so uh, we reserve that for God if you have your Bible uh, open it up to a couple of scriptures uh, one thing I will say right off the bat is that I am a uh, uh, a speaker that loves to use the word of God a lot so uh, if you brought your Bible have it ready if you didn't we're going to put it up on the screen it'll be up on the screen uh, the King James Version will be on the screen I use the New American Standard uh, Bible uh, but it, it's all the same message just said a little bit differently and you can follow along I want that everything I say rest on the authority of the Word of God. I don't want it to be my opinion. I don't want it to be my word. I want it to be, what does God say? Because your opinion and my opinion are equally valid. Everyone's opinion, everyone has an opinion. And who's to say whose opinion is better than the other one, right? All our opinions are of equal value. Some, of course, are based on more information than others, but we all have a mind, we all think. So uh, in that sense, all opinions are equal. But when it goes to the Word of God, it's a different thing. It's, it's not an, an opinion. It's, if it's clearly said in the Word of God, it's God speaking. And whenever anyone is reading the Bible, especially a pastor, uh, and they're, they're speaking directly from the Bible. It's, it's God speaking through them because it's God's word. That's what it is. You don't take the word of any man, but take the word of God as authority. Praise the Lord. Second Corinthians 13 verse 5. And I want you to keep that handy. And also, uh, First John chapter 2 verse 19. Those are going to be our two opening scriptures. And I want you to have kind of like your, your finger on both of those, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and uh, 1 John 2, 19 will be the two scriptures. But before we get into them, uh, I just want to say a few comments. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, we have been in these uh, almost three months Bible study uh, on Wednesday nights on Christian counterfeits. Uh, it has been amazing to cover the, the things that we covered. Uh, there are many, many religions in the world. Many. And, and uh, everyone's, people sometimes will say, well, who's right? If there's so many religions out there, we don't even know which to pick. We're confused. Uh, for the average person that has no experience in the Word of God, it can really be overwhelming. Uh, one of the first things that we have to do, though, uh, and I said it again, and I'll say it this morning, or I'll repeat myself, is what authority do we stand on? And we stand on the authority of the Word of God. We're a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. We make no excuses about it, apologies. We believe the Word of God. The Word of God is our manual for life. It's our foundation, and that's what we stand upon. Apart from the Word of God, I really don't have much to say. I could entertain you with a poem or a song, maybe not even do that good. Entertaining you with a poem or a song, uh, I could tell you my life story, 
story, whatever, you know, which probably put you to sleep. But when it comes to the Word of God, apart from the Word of God, I don't have much to say. Uh, I love the Word of God. I love reading it. I love studying it. And most importantly, I love applying it in my life. That's a difficult part. Reading it, studying it, learning it, it's, it's a lot easier than applying it. But uh, it's, it's like you can read about a medicine and you can read of all the benefits it has and you can even say, yes, those are the symptoms I have. This medicine will really help me. Let me read more. Someone will come along and say, what are you doing? I'm reading this medicine that is real helpful for me. Great. So what are you going to do next? Nothing. I'm just going to keep reading. It makes me feel better. Well, is it going to help you? <laughs> If you read it and read it, but you never take it, you know, after you read enough and you said, wow, it addresses all my symptoms, it's safe, it's FDA registered, whatever, approved, but you got to take the medicine and you got you to gotta let it do its work in your, in your body and your health for it to work. It's good to read. You need to read what you're taking. It's very important, but it ain't, it's not going to do any good until you actually take the medicine and let it do its job. And that's the same thing with the Word of God. We can read it, read it, and we can say how beautiful and everything, but if we don't apply it in our life, it won't do any good. So we studied, we, we even covered a few different religions in our class. We covered movements. We covered doctrines. The Bible is uh, teach, has a lot to say in this area. Uh, everyone who is serious about their religion believes they have the truth. We certainly believe we have the truth or else we wouldn't be here, right? I don't think you would be here if you said, I think this church teaches false doctrine, but I like it. I like the pastor. I like the building. So I keep coming even though I think they're teaching a pack of lies, but I still like it. No, you, you wouldn't be here. Uh, I wouldn't be here, you know, if I didn't believe that this church is teaching the truth. Uh, and, and so that's why we are here. Uh, we believe we have the truth. Obviously, uh, there are many other people and many other religions that believe they have the truth as well. And sometimes religions point the finger at one another and they say, no, we have the truth. They don't. They, and, and the other one says, no, we have it. You don't. The other one says, no, we have it. You don't. Obviously, we, we can't all be right, right? If we say the other one is wrong and we're right, then we can't all be right because someone's got to be right and and we believe differently so in the in the crucial matters i'm not talking about small differences that sometimes evangelicals have among themselves but i'm talking about the foundational issues of salvation and the word of god uh i was reading well, let, let's read the scripture and then I'm going to share with you uh, something that I just read very recently in a newspaper article. This is 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and this is what it says. If you'll follow along, it's up there on the screen or if you have your Bible. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. So are you a believer? Are you a Christian? Do you, uh, is that what you profess to be? Well, here the Apostle Paul says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. See, we don't discourage questions. We don't discourage testing and, and examining Scripture. In fact, we encourage you. We've said it in our classes. Everything you hear on the radio, online, Everything you hear other preachers say, even from people that say they're Christians like us, compare it with the Word of God. Ask questions. Examine it carefully. Don't just swallow everything hook, line, and sinker. So it says, test yourself to see if you are in the face. Examine yourselves, or do you not know, do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. Sobering words for us as believers to test ourselves. Remember I said we, we like to believe that we have the truth. Uh, we believe we do. And we believe that uh, the church and the faith we belong to is the truth. And that's why we are here. Second John chapter, first John, excuse me, chapter 2 verse 19. And we read these words. I'm going to. I'm going to read verse 18 just to give it context. Sorry, text. You'll just go up one verse. 
and, and, and uh, translator, Pastor Barajas, instead of 19, we'll start with 18. First John 2, 18. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. Remember we're talking about test yourself, examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith. And here the Apostle John, the beloved, one of Jesus' closest disciples, the inner circle you could say, uh, he's, he's talking about people that left the church and he said that uh, they were with us but they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. So there's some natural pruning, some weeding out done by God and the Holy Spirit and by people themselves that, that uh, leave uh, the faith. Now, I, I just read an article, this is by, uh, uh, an article about a pastor named Richard Cortez. Now you would think was a Z is Spanish, but this one is, was an S. Also Puerto Rican, I think. Uh, he was a pastor of a Messianic congregation in Sholo, Arizona. And ma Messianic are Jews who have come to accept Jesus as Messiah believe that he is the Messiah. And actually the early church, that's how it started. It was primarily Jewish believers. The Gentiles, the non-Jewish people came in later after the Apostle Paul was converted, was uh, became a Christian himself and began preaching to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. But before that, Christianity was basically all Jews that came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But then as time went by, many of them fell back into their old traditions and they forgot about Jesus. And here Richard Cortez was a Messianic Jews. I, I've heard that there's over 200,000 Messianic Jews in the United States. They're obviously a small minority compared to all the Jewish population, but there is, they're growing uh, and they're reaching out to their Jewish brothers to show them from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God, the promised one. But Richard Cortez is one that actually went backwards. He was a pastor of a Messianic congregation in Sholo, Arizona, that he started himself, and it began to grow. Uh, and one day he took a trip to a, a, a theme park called the Holy Land Experience in Florida. It, it's, it's, a, it's a small replica of the city of Jerusalem, of the temple actually. Uh, and he went in there and he started seeing all the sites and everything. And it's, it's weird because it's supposed to be a place to reinforce our faith in Christ. But it, it had the opposite effect for him. He marveled at the imaginative creations of the biblical world that he had been studying. He explored the second temple era replica of Jerusalem. He strolled through a scriptorium that displayed the Torah scrolls. But when he encountered a park employee... Uh, playing the character of Aaron, the biblical priest, the brother of Moses, and he heard the blast of the shofar uh, Aaron carried, something broke open deep inside Pastor Cortez. He realized he wanted to experience religion the way Aaron in the Old Testament did. Cortez couldn't sleep that night, staying up in a fervor of weeping and prayer. His soul had been stirred by the encounter, and the feeling was so intense, he would later liken it to being reunited with a long-lost parent. He also was a little embarrassed. Traditional Christianity was now so clearly, in his eyes, a false religion. And he kicked himself for not having realized this sooner. So here we have a person that's a Christian like us. He's even a pastor of a Messianic congregation. And he leaves Christianity to go back into Judaism because of something that happened at this theme park that got him thinking. And now we, we realize that... Uh, that some people leave one religion for another. 
I, I personally have a relative that uh, that left her religion to go uh, Christianity, our religion. And she was going to church regular. And then one day she has left the church and decided to join another whole different faith. And and I asked her why, and she said, "Well, I just like I, I like the symbolism they had. I like the the uh, the physical part of their religion, the ceremonies, and everything. And she believes that her new religion is just a better version of Christianity. How did this happen? How does a person leave one religion for another? We have." We don't apologize for it. We welcome everybody. We have former Catholics. In fact, probably our church is made up of more former Catholics than anything else that are now uh, Protestant Christians along with us. Uh, do we question why they left their religion to join us? Uh, no, we rejoice. We're happy. We welcome them. We're glad. Uh, what makes them think that they now have the truth and why do we agree with them? the former Catholics that have joined our church. What makes them think, some of them now are, are really into the word of God and they're really into the church and they say, this is it, this is what I was looking for. I've got the truth now and we agree with them. I want to challenge, why? Why do we think that way? And, and why do we, I mean, think about it, if it's the opposite way around, and I just want you to bear with me. I know you're probably thinking, where is he going with this? Is he having doubts about his faith too? Does he want to leave the church? Oh no, pastor, you can leave us too and go into another religion. No, I, I'm being very realistic because sometimes we're, we're close-minded and we think, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. And we won't even stop to think, well, why are you right? And that's one thing I've been saying in the class, that we need to be thinkers. We need to stop. We need to know what we believe in and why we believe in it. Not just say, well, this is the religion that I have been raised in. This is the religion of my parents. And this is all I believe in. I don't want to hear nothing else. This is the way I was born. And this is the way that I will die. Our faith has to have a foundation. What is our foundation? Because everyone claims to have the truth. And I've talked to people that are non-church people. And they say, you're just another church among many. In a way, they're right. We are one among many. But we're more than that. Because I tell people, you're right. But you know what? I'm not here to preach to you about my church. I'm not here to preach to you about my denomination, assemblies of God, uh, not even my opinions and my beliefs. Because quite frankly, our church can't save you. You don't have to be a member of our church to be saved. And, and, and our church did not die for you. <laughs> so our church... We don't tell people, you have to be a member of our church and you have to believe everything we tell you or you're going straight to hell. You have to be just like us. It's because it's not about us. It's about God. That's what it really is. It's all about God. We Remember I said, we have to have a foundation. We have to know what we believe and why we believe it, or else we might wind up like these people I mentioned, which is just a few examples of people who have left their faith. And you know it takes a lot to leave your faith. It takes a lot to say, I was wrong. I was, I, I didn't, that was not the truth, or it wasn't all the truth, it was half the truth. That is a big, big decision to make, especially if that's where you were born and raised in that faith, and then to come out of it, and to now, and you know there's people that are former Muslims, former uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, former Mormons that now are Christians, they love God, and they're saying that, I found the truth, and that's a big decision to make. Uh, put yourself in that place. What if you left Christianity, and you say, now I found the truth here in this other religion? That would be big. It would affect your family that, that are Christians. It would affect your brothers and sisters in the Lord. So it is a big decision. So it has to be a very serious 
thought out decision. And again, the point that I'm getting to and what we've been studying about counterfeit Christianity is that there's a lot of religions that say they're the truth and that they have the truth, but how do you know? How do you know? We base everything on one foundation. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and verse 26, and this is our foundation. Therefore, Jesus is speaking the word of God. The word of God, we go to the Bible. We want to be as close to the Bible as we can because it's not about my opinions. It's not about my church. It's not about my religion. What does the word of God say? Now, if you say, bah, I don't believe the word of God, throw it out the door. Well, there's not much I can do for you until the Holy Spirit begins to do a work in you and begins to tug you and bring you in and you begin to say, well, I do believe the Bible. I don't practice it, but I do believe it's, it's God's book. Well, then we've got something to work with. But look what Jesus said. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, two important things. Remember what I was talking about medicine? You read a label on the medicine. It, it, will that make you well? Man, I just got to read it five more times and I'm going to get rid of this headache. <laughs> you got to take the pill. You know, at some point you got to take the pill. Uh, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on what? On the rock. That's a foundation. He built his house on the rock. And then, uh, verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them. See, it's not enough to just hear the Bible, to hear the word of God. You, we've got to apply it to our life. We've got to take it in and let it have the effect that it wants to have. So whoever hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on what? Sand. The sand. Foundation. Very important. What is our foundation? The Gospels introduce us to the teachings of Jesus and the epistles elaborate or expound or expand on that knowledge. They, they build on that knowledge. They develop it. And that's where our faith comes from. Look at what Romans 10, 17 says. Chapter 10, and I'm using scripture just like I promised you that I would use. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by what? The word of Christ. See, this is one of the epistles, the epistle to the Romans by the Apostle Paul. And, and they're elaborating, repeating, explaining what Jesus said. So faith comes by the hearing the word of God. Holy Spirit uses that to get our faith growing. So we don't just believe for the sake of believing we have a foundation there is something there is someone that we believe in and it's the word of God Jesus said these words very very clearly he said I am the way the truth and the life he said that at John 14 6 I don't know if I gave it to you guys back there but don't worry about it I want I, I was going to just say it very briefly by memory I am the way the truth and the life. So Jesus calls himself the truth. He stood before Pilate when he was about to be condemned to be crucified. And Pilate asked that question. What is the truth? Everybody is telling me that you're guilty. I don't find no guilt in you. But people want you crucified. And I hear this side and I hear that side. And then I hear your side. I don't know what the truth is. What is the truth? Here Jesus is saying, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Wow. So if you're seeking truth, truth is more than just something. It's someone. Hallelujah. Christianity is more than a religion, more than a denomination, and more than a church. Christianity is a relationship. It is a person. The person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what it's all about for us. A relationship with 
Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary. Why we study the Bible, why we sing, why we come to church. It's all because of our relationship with Jesus Christ as we want to grow in that relationship closer to him. We want to be more pleasing. We want to be more Christ-like. And everything we do is toward that goal of that relationship with Jesus Christ. If any of us are doing it for any other reason, we become just like any other religion. Not even worth staying in if it's not about Jesus Christ. This is the difference between being and doing. For some people, religion is something you do. But for the true believer, uh, being born again and being in a relationship with Christ is about who we are. That's why we take it from here to the house, to the job, to the neighborhood. Everywhere we go, we are first and foremost Christians, believers, children of God. And we, and, 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 and we come to the church as, as a time to separate ourselves from this crazy world that throws so much at us, to hear the word, to refresh ourselves spiritually, to worship God. But then we go back out to the world, hallelujah, and we become what Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify who? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. In other words, God uses our life as we shine forward who we are becoming in the lost world. It's more than just Sunday. It's more than just Wednesday. It's every day. It's everywhere. Every moment. Why? Because it's who we are. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. Some of the most precious, spiritually strengthening times for me have not been in the church. You know where they've been? On my walks to the hill. <laughs> in my prayer closet. Sometimes even driving down the road. You know, I'm over there. I've even been at Walmart and all of a sudden I'm just thinking about the things of God and I'm praising God. And you know, and, and a tear will come to my eye and I'm just walking around. And sometimes the devil comes, you better stop it. Those people are going to think if that old man, his feet hurt that badly walking, he had to sit down. Why is he crying? But I'm crying because my feet hurt. I'm crying because my heart is full of God everywhere. Does this sound like religion? No. This is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. How can you leave that? How can you leave that for something else that you have to do rituals? You have to do uh, little things to make God happy with you. You've got to make sure you don't forget this and don't forget that. And you've got to sign your name on a book or else you're going to go to hell. No. Hallelujah. This is something beautiful. It's a relationship. Now, open your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. And verse 21, it is in view of this, in view of this, that we are given this warning. Paul is speaking to his spiritual son, Timothy. He says, oh, Timothy, guard. I want you to focus in on that word. Everyone say guard. Guard. What do you think of when you say guard? Take care of, Take care of protect. Make sure you don't lose it. Guard. Oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. They've gone astray. They've left the faith. Why? Because they haven't guarded what was entrusted. So we are admonished. We were studying during the, the counter, Christian counterfeit series that the Bible teaches clearly that there are false prophets, there are false brethren, there are false doctrines, there are false teachings. And here we're told to guard. So, so we have something valuable. We have something beautiful. But why? Why are there these false doctrines? That's a, that's a true reality. The fact that we're told to guard means we can lose something if we're not careful. And that's why we're told to guard what has been entrusted. Uh, the fact that there are false prophets. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 13 through 15. And we read these words. For such men are false apostles. 
deceitful workers. And it's very interesting when the Bible talks about false workers, false apostles, it even goes further by saying, distinguishing themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises, I put down distinguishing, I'm sorry, disguising themselves as false apostles. For no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servant also disguise himself as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. So here we have a second warning. The first warning is guard what you have. The second, that's the first warning. The second warning is be careful because the devil is very tricky. Even this, there's false prophets and they disguise themselves. They look like the real thing. So how can we know, Pastor Pete? How can we know? We must know the word of God. And, and, and I, we taught in the series, this is what pastors are for. This is what churches are for. This is what the Holy Spirit is for. And what a close and growing relationship with Jesus will protect us from. Jesus said, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They know my voice and they follow me. And they won't follow someone else because they don't recognize their voice. What does that speak of? That speaks of a familiarity. You become familiar. How many of you have dogs? You have small dogs, big dogs, cats? No cats. <laughs> when you call your pet, do you just say, hey, you dog, come over here? You don't, huh? Why? It is a dog, isn't it? But you call it by what? By its name. That's interesting, huh? You could be walking your dog and let him go for a little while and there could be some other dogs there. But you call your dog by his name and your dog will come and the other dogs won't. Why? Because the dog knows your name and the dog follows you. It's yours. You have a relationship. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. And they won't follow somebody else because they don't know his voice. A close relationship with God helps us to recognize the voice of God. And it, there's an alert bell that goes on. This is not from God. It's not the voice of my master. And they won't follow it. Very, very important. So the pastor, by virtue of his position, that God has made us responsible as pastors to feed the flock, to protect the sheep, to teach. We're responsible before you, but even more before God. The church, the church can't save you, but the church is sure a great place for getting friends and fellow travelers that will encourage you and lift you up and and be there for you maybe even hold you accountable we all need a good friend that will tell us the truth right or do you want friends that just say yeah you look fine imagine you, you you're going out somewhere and 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 you got some big old smear on your face and you got it after you looked in the mirror and you're out or you got something between your teeth something green you ate and it, it won't go away and then you go out and you ask your friend do i look all right and you smile and your friend say sure you look fine well i don't want to hurt their feelings but you have this big green teeth thing between your teeth and you're out smiling at everybody else would a friend tell you the truth Absolutely. And that's a friendship here. <laughs> you got something green between your teeth. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And so the church, the pastor, the word of God, the Holy Spirit, and a close growing relationship with Jesus Christ are absolutely necessary to remain and grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18 we're not to stay the same way we are when we first came uh, to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Second Peter uh, chapter 3 verse 18. I didn't mark it off, but I got it here. And it says, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, we're not to stay the same. I'm saved, that's it. I don't have to do nothing else. No, here it says, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. So how do we grow? That's how we grow. Bible study. Being involved with the church. We have opportunities to serve others, not just think about ourselves. The Holy Spirit teaching Learning more about God. 
In the end, it's all about God. It's not about our church, our denomination, or our family tradition. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm going to repeat that again. In the end, Christianity is not about our church, not about our denomination, or our family tradition. It's about God. He's the one we want to follow. He's the one we want to love. He's the one we want to obey and the one that we want to spend eternity with. He loved us. He died for us. He brought us into his family. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. He's coming back for us. Hallelujah. And he's prepared a place for us in heaven. Life on earth will one day end, but we will live forever with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's what Christianity is all about. I think sometimes we make less of it. Sometimes we make more of it. We start getting into all kinds of rules and rituals and trying to say, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that. But what you got to do is fall in love with Jesus. That's what you got to do. You got to fall in love with Jesus. You got to let him touch your heart and minister to you and become the most important thing in your life. Everything else flows from that. Your love for church, your love for the word of God, your interest for the things of God will all flow from a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the most beautiful thing that we can think of. If you're just doing religion and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't know if you found the truth yet until you find Christ. And again, like I said, it's not about joining a church. It's not about becoming part of a denomination or becoming like somebody else that you admire unless the one you admire is Jesus. It's all about coming to Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul put it so easy in Romans 10, 9. If thou wilt confess with thy mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It takes repentance. We have to recognize we're sinners. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar, and his truth is not in us. We're sinners. We're lost. We can't save ourselves. It comes natural to do the things that we know are wrong since we were little. Who taught us to lie? Who taught us to disobey? Who taught us to get in trouble? Oh, well, friends maybe influenced us, but it sure didn't take long how to do all. It's a lot easier to do the things that are right. That's my point. It just comes as natural as can be to disobey, to break rules, to want my way. <laughs> That's our nature. We can't save ourselves. We can't change ourselves. But oh, how beautiful when Christ comes into a life and we surrender to him and he begins to change us from the inside out. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is in us and he begins to do the work. We, and the way that happens is by repenting putting all our trust and faith in Jesus that he died for us. He rose from the dead. His death was for us to pay for all our sins, past, present, and future, and to live for him the rest of our life. Every head. Your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no